So today I'm presenting on elephant endotheliotrophic herpes virus, or EEHV. So there are currently 19 different variations or strains of this that have been discovered. There's more research going into identifying more. And EEHV affects both African and Asian elephants. But today I'm going to be looking at a particular variation, which is called elephanted beta herpes virus. And within that, I'm looking at EEHV1A as it's the most pathogenic. And it's actually interesting because it is found in healthy asymptomatic elephant herd mates. And it can be seen in their trunk washes. So when you put water into their trunk and then they put it out, you can actually find this in asymptomatic elephants. However, it's extremely pathogenic because it does cause a hemorrhagic disease in calves, which are any young elephants up to eight years of age. And it's interesting because it's found in captive Asian populations, but also we suspect that the hemorrhagic diseases are affecting the wild, but it's hard to prove or support this because of access to the bodies afterwards. And so moving on to the symptoms, the onset of initial symptoms are sudden, but they're, very, they're not very specific. And so it includes things like lethargy, colic, diarrhea, and food refusal. But as the disease progresses, the signs associated with blood loss and shock appear. And so this would be tachycardia, the rapid heartbeat, the decreased blood cell count. And late stages include cyanosis of the tongue, mouth ulcers, and edema of the head and trunk. And from onset of symptoms to death is about 24 hours. So this is a view of a tongue in the very advanced stages. You can see the cyanosis occurring here. And this is caused by the reduced circulating volume, the reduced cardiac output, and the progressive pulmonary edema. This is a young Asian elephant who was at this point still alive. Um, this is the late stages of EEHV. And here you can see the generalized edema of the head and neck, and then it's particularly noticeable for the swollen mandibular area. Some calves can become recumbent as shown here, but others can walk around until they literally drop dead. As far as the diagnosis and prognosis, anti-mortem diagnosis is a PCR. So a real-time PCR assay can be used uh, that specifically <laughs> detects EEHV1. And then it can be used to evaluate whole blood samples as well as the trunk wash samples that I talked about. You can also look at clinical pathology, including lymphopenia and dehydration and anemia, and then the symptoms that I previously listed. Like I mentioned, it is a very uh, pathogenic disease and the survival rate is very low, so there's, there's an 85% mortality rate. The survival rate is so low for several reasons, one being the virus is extremely virulent and the disease progresses so rapidly. And since it does progress so rapidly, the laboratory diagnosis of the disease can take more than 24 hours, yet it does cause death within 24 hours. So you actually would have to start treatment before EEHV is even confirmed or like differentiated among other diseases. And in addition, the treatment requires aggressive around the clock care, necessita necessitating trained animals, experienced veterinarians, and access to testing and treatment supplies. So as far as treatment, there's nothing really to stop it. It's more supportive care treating the secondary causes and the hemorrhaging that is occurring. So the first step is to, the first step of treatment is rectal administration of three to four boluses of lukewarm tap water. And the dose that is believed to work is 10 to 20 milliliters per kilogram. And then you basically reassess the vital, vital signs and continue doing at an equine maintenance rate. So one thing that's interesting is that there's not a lot of research into uh, the specific dosage values for elephants. So what often happens is they use equines as the base and then they scale it to the elephant size. Um, so this would stop early signs of shock by drawing back the extra vascular fluid into the vascular compartment. And then you would have to do this even before the diagnosis is confirmed by the PCR. You could also start a two week course of um, which is or mannitol, um, no, just around five. And basically you would do 16 milligrams per kilogram and that would be via the rectum and you do it three times a day and then change it to 12 after the first day. 
You can also use antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drugs to counteract secondary infections or reduce or prevent further pathology. Diuretics like mannitol can also be used for management of the peripheral and cerebral edema. And it's also important to provide supplemental oxygen therapy to any and all patients that are having clinical signs. And as this is a fairly newish disease, it was discovered the first case in um, a zoo in 1995, so there's still currently no vaccine. So for post-mortem diagnosis, this is the most common way to find out what actually happened. So hemorrhages are found throughout the body due to how the virus attacks the endothelial cells. So they end up rupturing the capillaries and causing general blood loss and hemorrhaging. And once this reaches the heart, the hemorrhage kills fairly quickly through shock. And just as a note, the next few, shy, the few slides show pictures from a necropsy done at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. It's of a young elephant that was expected to have EEHV, which was later confirmed. So this right here is a picture of the heart, the hydropericardium of an EEHV affected Asian elephant. And then this shows the blood clots occurring on the heart and the epi, endo, and myocardium of the surfaces. And then this is one of the brain. It's the, it shows the intracranial hemorrhages and edema in an infected Asian elephant. And then this was when they opened the pericardium. It's often hemorrhagic seeing everything like that. And the, as far as the hydropericardium, this is several uh, meters of intracranial hemorrhages and fluids that were pulled out. As far as my experience, in the summer of 2015, I went on a veterinary workshop in Thailand with a group called Luba Broad. So I spent a week at the Elephant Nature Park in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And there, working with the Asian elephants, we learned the importance of mahouts, which are the people seen here and here, and they're the ones who directly watch the elephants every day, 365 days a year. They spend their whole time out there with them, watching their behavior, watching what they eat, just to make sure that they're, everything is normal because there are a lot of diseases that do affect them, and they affect them very quickly. We also worked here, these are two of the trainers. So the place, the Elephant Nature Park is an open sanctuary with like boulders on the side so the elephants can't escape. So when you are in the park, it's completely open. So they do create barriers like this to work on training. And this is where we did training on opening and presenting the mouth for looking for ulcers, also training for trunk washes. And we also learned and saw the importance of isolation and how to correctly introduce different elephants into herds because as I said, there were 19 different variations of EEHV and they can be found within different populations of the elephants depending on the area in which they are in. And so it's important to introduce them slowly and have a period of isolation. So my personal experience, I worked with researchers from Chiang Mai University on a study about the diet of Asian elephants and then I learned about their EEHV research and became interested in that. And this is one of the little babies that was there. Funny story, if you go close to them, the other elephants will come and run at you. So we had a whole herd of elephants running after us. We had to quickly run out of sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And so these are my references. And are there any questions? Okay, let's give her a round of applause. Sounds like a neat place to do a little study. Questions, comments? Yeah, it's not with the death within 24 hours. Yes. That's a fast And that's from like training. seeing, yes. That it's is very crazy. fast. It's killed over 80 um, young elephants in the zoo system in America. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. So now, one thing about zoos, and it's very, I think it's interesting. And I should, last time I went on a zoo trip and a tour, I should have asked this, but you know they have all these crazy amounts of animals, different kinds, and how many are actually vaccinated for diseases? Because no one makes, you know, you yep. can you can make dog and cat vaccines and make some money on it, the drug company, but yeah. the drug companies, you know, aren't too excited about these, I don't think. So No, there's not a lot of vaccine for zoo animals, and it's also, there's not a lot of protocols for how to deal with them mm -hmm. when problems do occur, so like, right. like I said with the elephants, they use like equine numbers. And yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. With them. They're using e equine as a model to yep. scale up by weight, yeah, so it, it's got to be interesting. I, that's one thing I wish I could do is... I know the zoos have a society and they have meetings different places yep. and uh, 
some of our past animal science graduates have gone on to work at zoos. I remember Wendy, she was the nutritionist, nutritionist at the Bronx Zoo, which I've never been there. I've been in San Diego, but a few others, but yeah, very interesting and fast moving. Yeah. Okay. And last but not